Most entrepreneurs I know complain of lack of time to work on their business. There's just no time, Graham, to work on my business, to grow my business, to implement that idea. Well, my friend, you don't have time because that's not how time works. You make time. And unfortunately, most of us entrepreneurs are awful at making time for the important stuff because we're really good at wasting time. Although we wouldn't look at it as waste, but it is. And in today's episode, I want to unpack the five biggest time wasters that I see entrepreneurs struggle with so that you can identify them, be honest with yourself, eliminate these time wasters, and then magically wake up with a lot more time on your hands to do the stuff you know you need to do to either start your business or grow it. Let's discuss. Welcome to episode 113 of The Graham Cochran Show, where I'm here to help you build your online business, work less, and live and give more. I'm your host, Graham Cochran. Today, we're going to talk about the work less part to make sure that you actually have the time to do the important things and don't waste time on things that aren't as important. I really love efficiency. I'm a weirdo. Every year, I try to see how I can remove hours for my work week while not only maintaining my income, but actually growing my income. And so over the years of doing this kind of stuff, I've identified, again, like I said, five of the biggest time wasters that I've been a part of, that I've tried to eliminate from my workflow, and then now coaching online business owners for the last few years, seeing the exact same thing in them. So we're going to break down those five time wasters. I guarantee you, you're struggling with at least one of these, if not two to three. So I want you to be able to identify them because once you do, remove them from your weekly workflow, you're going to have all this open space to be able to really get some exponential growth in your business while you do the activities that truly will grow your business. If time is short and you're trying to find time to start your business on the side, or if you have a service-based business, maybe you're a consultant or a coach, and you're like, I really need to create some passive income in my business because I've hit that ceiling. I can't keep charging more, can't keep taking on more clients. I need to scale. And so you're like, how do I find time to build passive income into my business? I don't have time for that either. I've got good news for you. The way I teach passive income, you only need 30 minutes a day to get started. I have an entire workshop that teaches you how to build your first $1,000 a month recurring passively in just 30 minutes a day. So this is perfect to just start your online business or like I said if you have a service based business to add a passive income element which will start to free up your time as you replace that income with some passive income and then you can really grow exponentially. It's 45 minutes of hard teaching, it's super helpful. I'm going to walk you through the four components of passive income, everything you need to figure out your profitable idea, to launching, to email scripts you can use for your products, everything, including all the tools that I use and that I recommend you use, both cheap and you know free, and then how to put it all together. So it's amazing. It's a free workshop. You got to watch it. If you haven't already, just go to grahamcochran.com slash workshop. Or if you're watching on YouTube, just click the link below. Check it out. It's free, on demand, whenever you're ready. Okay. Let's dive in to the five biggest time wasters I see entrepreneurs dealing with. And let's start with the biggest behemoth of them all, and that is email. Yeah, email is a time waster. When I say email, I don't mean email marketing, outbound emails to your list, promoting your products or services. That's time worth spending, right? That is how you make this business work. Now, a lot of that email marketing should be automated inside of your email funnel. And so the great news about that is you do the work once and those emails go out every day to brand new people who join your list and they strategically over deliver, add credibility, uh, nurture them and pitch your products. But your weekly email should be going out at least a weekly email minimum, right? Weekly email, letting them know about your latest free piece of content. You know, when you're doing your monthly promotions or your quarterly promotions, that kind of email, wonderful, great, good, do it. What I'm talking about is you getting into your inbox, responding to fans, haters, people who are trying to promote stuff to you, customer service inquiries, like the normal stuff in your inbox that awaits you as an entrepreneur, right? And as the beginning 
you know, days aren't too bad, you notice over time that that inbox grows. If your audience is growing online, your reach grows, your email is going to grow. Okay. It's inevitable. That's a giant time waster. There's not much of that email you really need to respond to. Now that might sound, sound ludicrous to you, but it, it's true. Most of the email that you receive, first of all, just because you receive an email doesn't mean that warrants a response. I don't know if you believe me or agree with me, but let's go back to the beginning here. You receive an email. There is no law that I know of in my country or in any country that says you must respond to that email. That's like just a prison that we build in our own minds. It's a, it's a false narrative of like, oh gosh, I got to email that person back. No, you don't. No, you don't. Oh, they'll think I'm a jerk. No, they won't. They'll just think you're busy. Some people might think you're a jerk, but like that's life, right? There's people that think you're a jerk no matter what you do. Um, but no, you don't have to respond to them. Now, there's certain emails that I think do warrant a response. And let's start with those. Customer emails, right? If you have a customer who has a problem with their product, oh, for sure, they should get an email. If they can't get into their your Kajabi backend to you know access their products. If they need a refund, or if you have a member in a membership product and they want to cancel, like yeah, absolutely, they they deserve a response. Okay. Your haters, they don't deserve a response. Even your super fans don't necessarily need a response. A lot of times, you will find that your fans who love you will send you an email to thank you or to just say you're doing an awesome job. And if you notice over time, your super of super fans don't even need a response. They'll even say, hey, you don't even have to respond to me. I just want you to know that you're freaking awesome. I love people like that because they know that I'm busy. They understand that it's not a conversation they're trying to start. They're just trying to just send me a thank you note. Now, I think it's nice to be able to thank those people and respond to them, but it's not necessary though. So that if you have margin for that, great. If there's potential partnerships and collaborations, like don't have FOMO, like unless it's the biggest person in the world, like, you know, you could always reach back out to them later if you catch up with that email later, or if you miss a, a possible collaboration, so you missed it, it's, it's okay. It's okay. There will always be more. If you have a friend or a colleague in the space that's emailing you. Look, you don't you don't have to respond to every single email when it comes in. So what I'm saying is I want to free you from the pressure to respond to every email. That is a false pressure. You don't have to. And and there's two there's two ways to solve this email time waster thing. Three ways, excuse me. And let let's explain them because this will give you some context. Number one, not every email warrants a response. That's why I started there. There's some emails that you can just let come in and disappear, and that's okay. Secondly, there are the type of emails that do necessitate a response, but that doesn't always necessarily mean you have to respond to them. That's where like your customer service emails come in. You can hire that out. You can have your assistant, your virtual assistant, handle that. They get in your inbox, whether you use Gmail or whatever, or you could get a little fancier with something like Help Scout or Zendesk, where you can sort of track emails. It's the same kind of thing. It's a little more slick, but they get into your inbox and they look for customer service type emails. So they might have to read all your emails, they might have to skim and get a sense of what the emails are, but they take care of like handling refunds or answering questions or getting people's logins or canceling their membership or whatever it is. That way, those people are always getting a response. I have my assistant get in my inbox at least once a day, Monday through Friday, so that I don't have to handle those emails anymore. That does a couple things for me. One, I don't have to see the refund requests, so it sort of keeps my soul intact. But then two, I'm not an email every day. So this allows my customers who need a response to get responded to within 24 hours, which I think is a fair ask, except for over the weekends, which I'm not a huge company, so I think that's fine too. Um, within 24 hours, they're gonna get a response and they're gonna get taken care of. But it doesn't have to be me, so it doesn't have to be you either. So some emails don't need a response, some emails you can hire out, and then guess what? You can batch your emails. You don't have to be in your inbox every day. Most entrepreneurs have their email tab open as if it's like, you know, AOL Instant Messenger, if you're old enough to remember that, like a giant chat. It's Email's not a chat. It's mail. 
You don't stand next to your mailbox at the front of your street or in your apartment building just waiting to see if anything, you know, like opening and closing it. Open, clo- nope, no mail. Open, close, no mail. Like, you don't do that with your physical mailbox. Why would you do that with your digital mailbox? It's electronic mail. That's all it is. It's not a chat service. It's mail. So I check my mail at my house once a day, right? And I only usually do that because it gets full and then the, the mail lady will like to be shoving stuff in. It'll fall out. My email, at least over the summer, since I'm only in the office once a week, I'm only working one day a week this summer, I'm checking my email once a week. One hour, once a week. That's all I'm doing. You know, at best, you need to just check it once a day. Like if you're in the, in the office every day, just check it once a day. That's it, once. And don't check it in the morning. Don't check it first thing in the morning. The problem with that is that it becomes a bunch of requests for you to do and things to respond to. So now you're just, you're, you're, you're obeying all the little bosses in your inbox, following their commands and fetching things for them before you've even done the stuff that you need to do to move your business forward. That's why you always want to come in, do your most important thing before 11 a.m., and then, you know, ideally you're checking email in the later afternoon. I try to check it right before I go so that I send responses and then they, if they respond to me, I'm out. Peace, I'm out. I don't want to get a response back and you're like, oh crap, I got to deal with that response. I want to send the email. I'll deal with it when I check email again, which for you might be the next day. So batch it. So stop responding to some emails. Hire out your assistant, your virtual assistant to handle your customer service emails and then batch your emails once a day. That's all you got to do. There's so much time lost in email and it feels productive. Inbox zero, I've done an entire episode on that. Inbox zero is a myth and it's pointless. Uh, it seems like a satisfying goal for a moment, but it, it doesn't put money in your pocket. It, it doesn't move the business forward. It just is activity, right? So email is one of the biggest time wasters. Number two, social media. I've talked about this at length again, like I have with email. So I don't want to go too much in depth here. But I want you to ask yourself the hard question when you're on TikTok or Instagram or Facebook or wherever you're at, Snapchat, is what I'm doing on this platform putting money in my pocket? That's all I want you to ask. Is what I'm doing on this platform putting money in my pocket? If it is, and for some of you it might be, you're going back and forth with a client right? Maybe you're a service, maybe you're a consultant, maybe you're a coach and you're touching base with people, you're following up on a lead and you might land a $5,000 client. Okay. If that's true for you, then you've answered that question. I don't mind you being on social media, but if you're just posting reels or you're trying to get this TikTok dance right, or you're just skimming through your feed or you're hearting every comment on your Instagram feed, can you justify that? Is that really putting money in your pocket? Yes or no? I mean, like, it's just that simple. Certain activities we know lead to money. When I post a YouTube video or a podcast like this, I know that this is putting money in my pocket. How do, well, Graham, how do you know that? Because that's the entire business model that I've set up. My content is my discovery engine, is my lead generation engine. In this content, what did I do at the beginning of the episode? I offered my lead magnet, which allows you to get on my email list, which allows you to go through my email funnel, which guess what? It's going to offer you my products. And then I know statistically what percentage of you will buy and what percentage of you will buy eventually down the road. At least you're on my list, even if you don't buy, and then I can promote to you down the road. Now that might sound cold, but I'm I'm trying to let you in behind the curtains so you understand how this works because I'm your friend, I'm your coach, I'm here to help you. I know that the most important thing I do each week is create a new piece of content. So yeah, I don't get paid the second I upload this. On this channel, I don't even have ads running, so I don't even monetize these videos. So I don't physically get paid by uploading a video, but I know it works in my business model. Instagram, there's some maybe vague notion that if I grow on Instagram or I grow on TikTok or I grow on Facebook, that or people will hear about me. And then it's like kind of what you said, Graham, they'll, they'll get onto my list and they'll buy my stuff, maybe. But the stats continue to show us that people don't buy off of social media. They don't engage with social media uh, 
in, in a purchasing mindset like they do with email marketing. So unless you are really good at using social media to get people on your email list, it's kind of just a fun thing to do and not really work. I think social media has become what my generation and the generation coming behind me thinks is what online business is. And unfortunately, it's just a giant distraction. So there's gonna be a lot of people growing big Instagram channels or big TikTok followings, and they're gonna feel good, and people are gonna actually look up to them and, and be like, how did you grow your big following? And there's gonna be a, another group of people over here that don't have a big following on social media, but you know what? They're making hundreds of thousands of dollars every year relatively passively by creating blog posts or podcasts or YouTube videos that draw traffic to their email list, to their online products. Nobody maybe even knows about them, but they're living an incredible lifestyle. If that's what you want over here, you got to understand how the business model works. Social media is just a giant time suck, giant time suck. So I don't mind you being on the platform. Just know that it's not really running your business. It's a thing you're choosing to do for fun. Maybe connect with your students or connect with your audience a bit to get keep your pulse on what they're interested in but it's not worth much of your time because it doesn't put money in our pockets, 99% of us. So social media, second biggest time waster. I'm gonna move on from that because I've done a ton of content on social media. If you wanna know more, go watch why I took a year off of social media and pretty much why I'm not going back. Um, number three, repetitive tasks that are easily outsourced. Dude, I suck at this one. Especially because I have so much time because my business is so efficient, I find myself still doing things that I don't need to be doing, like creating the thumbnails for my videos. I was doing that for years until my assistant was like, bro, I could do that for you. I was like, yeah, you're right. Why am I in Canva creating a thumbnail? You could do that, you know? Like it's a repetitive task, meaning it has to be done every single time I post a video. It's easily outsourced, meaning you just need to have somewhat of a creative eye and use a free tool like Canva. It doesn't require my face. It doesn't require my voice. It doesn't require my brain. Why am I still doing it? That's a great question. You should ask yourself. You should write a list of all the tasks you do in your business and then try to identify the ones that are repetitive in nature, always need to be done. They're not like once in a while. They're just like every week or every day. And then of those repetitive tasks that are happening all the time, do they require your face, your voice, or your unique skill set? If not, outsource them. Very easy. If you already have a virtual assistant, they might be able to tack it on for an hour a week or two hours a week and, and just pay them a little bit extra. Add a few more hours to their pay. If you don't have a virtual assistant, this might be a really good push for you to try to hire your first virtual assistant, even for someone for five hours a week, right? They could live anywhere in the world. You, you don't have to know them. They don't have to be local. They don't have to come over to your house. But five hours a week to just do something, whether it's upload your content into YouTube, whether it's to send out an email for you, whether it's to create a thumbnail, whatever it is. There's so many repetitive tasks that we do every single day or week that could be easily outsourced, but we think only we can do them. And I'm the, the biggest culprit of this. I don't trust human beings. <laughs> I, I like, I have, I'm a control freak. And so I'm like, well, I can do it. I should do it. And that's not great logic all the time. In the early days when you're sort of bootstrapping, trying to save money, yeah, that's a great mentality. Do it all yourself as long as you can. But at some point, you're wasting time doing repetitive tasks that could be easily outsourced. So that's part of your, your goal is to like think through what could I outsource this week to somebody, to my existing virtual assistant or hire one. You start with this one activity, get a sense of how life-giving it is to be able to say, you take care of this and you'll get addicted. Number four, fourth biggest time waster for entrepreneurs, tweaking your website. Stop it. <laughs> Just stop it. Like, you don't need a perfect website. You need a good enough website. You know what your website really exists to do, by the way? Collect an email address. That's the point of your website. Lead capture, right? Some people don't like that word capture. It sounds very violent, right? You have a place online. If you have your blog, you're getting some SEO. Even without the blog, you can get some SEO. But it's a place people are looking you up. They're checking out your website to see if you're legit. Most people think your website exists to be 
a giant business card. It's a giant floating business card in the sky. So it's all about you and it's all, you know, it's a love me wall and it's like connect with me here, follow me here, do this stuff. It's a giant waste of time. Your website exists to capture an email address because guess what? They're not going to come back to your website. You're lucky that they came to your website once. They're not going to come back. So you, you need to begin that relationship with them. The only way to stay in touch with them, the best way to stay in touch with them is email, not Instagram. Don't follow me on Facebook. Don't like me on Facebook. Don't none of this email. That being said, your website doesn't have to be that great. You don't have to change the color of your buttons. You don't have to keep tweaking your headline. Like you need a good headline that points people to your email list. You, you know, the top of your fold, like people, you should never make them scroll down. Like they might scroll down, but 80% of them statistically aren't going to scroll down. So the very first words on your website, the biggest words, those need to be the most important. They should explain who you help and what you help them do, or specifically the promise of a lead, of a, of a lead magnet, like a benefit-driven promise. So they land on it. They go, ooh, I want that. Maybe there's a subheadline that, ooh, yeah, details on what this free thing is. Click this button to opt in for it. That's what your website should really be about. Now, you can have all kinds of stuff on your website. I have an about page. I have a products page. I have these other pages. But they all point back to the same thing, which is to capture an email address. I don't tweak my website. Very rarely do I even do anything to it. Why? Because it doesn't put money in my pocket. You could change out your photo for a better photo. You could try this word over this word. You could make the graphics fly in or be static. Yeah, you could try different fonts, sure. It doesn't really matter. I have a buddy who said like, Graham, your website, for some reason, like the way the image is showing up on a massive screen, it's like cutting off your face, the, the way it's wanting to position the photo. And like, it's like a dynamic website, right? So on mobile, it moves the image and, and he sent me a screen grab of it. It looked ridiculous. That was months ago. I haven't had, I haven't even made the time to worry about that. Like part of me as a creative is like, that's pretty stupid. I should probably find a way to fix that. But then part of me is like, that's not going to affect whether money goes in my pocket or not. <laughs> so I'm just going to move on with my life and do the things that really matter, like launch this thing or promote to my list or get that video up. Right. So this is the way I want you to think like there's uh, it's all good stuff you could do. And maybe your website needs a refresh, but maybe it doesn't. Maybe the refresh on your site makes you feel better about your website, makes you feel more professional, but doesn't have a direct correlation with income going up. Maybe not. Probably not. Could be. Probably not. Right. I've seen too many people endlessly tweak their websites. It just, it, there's very little proof that that's going to put money in your bank account. All right, fifth and final time waster I see entrepreneurs struggling with, and that's paying attention to your competitors. And I've talked about this before, but one of the dumbest things you and I could do is to give a rip about what our competitors are doing. What your competitors are doing really has no bearing on what you're doing. I started my business, The Recording Revolution, in 2009, virtually in the dark. There was two things I didn't know. One, I didn't know that this business model existed. I didn't even know I was starting a business. Two, I didn't know what my competitors were doing because A, I didn't know this business model existed, so I didn't know there were any competitors. And to be fair, there probably weren't that many in my niche, at least. There are a ton now. The great thing about both being in the dark about the business model and my competitors was that I just kept my head down and I just focused on what I needed to do. And I would just make decisions that were based out of logic, like, okay, when I talk about these types of topics and videos, people seem to like it. Maybe I should make more videos about that. Okay, when I launched this kind of course, it made some money. What if I launched more courses that cost more? And maybe if I got more people on my list, would the money go up, right? Like very basic stuff is what I was doing. And so I focused on me, my students, my customers, how I could help them more, achieve the results they wanted, and then help. how could I sell more product? How could I make more money? 
The moment you start looking at your competitors, a couple of things happen. One, you know this, when you look at what other people are doing that you're, you're trying to do the same kind of thing, you're always insecure. It's just deep insecurity about, oh crap, look at her website. It's beautiful. Man, she has pink buttons. Should I have pink buttons? Right? Dude, look at his course launch emails. These emails are great. Gosh, are my emails that good? Hey, they're launching a membership. Should I be launching a membership? Ooh, they're on TikTok now. Should I be on TikTok? Like, they, oh, they're running a flash sale for Memorial Day. Should I be running a Memorial Day flash sale? Like, we start to doubt everything we're doing because we see them doing something that we're not doing, right? Statistically, everyone that's in your space is going to be doing something probably different than you're doing to some degree. So when you see them doing something different, you're like, uh, oh, should I be doing that? Unless you have the personality that's super, super confident, aka <clears throat> arrogant, confident that you think you're the best. If you think you're the best, you're going to see people doing other stuff and you're like, look at them doing other dumb stuff. I'm awesome. That's a small percentage of you. And then you know, you don't struggle with this. The rest of us, we're very insecure. And so we look at our competitors and we go, crap, what are they doing? Should I be doing that? And then that does two negative things. One, now we're in a negative headspace where we've lost our confidence. We're feeling, we're questioning everything we're doing. And you can never be successful in business without confidence. You have to be confident about what you're doing. Now, you might not know how it's going to work out. I'll raise my hand on that one. I don't know what's going to happen in the next six months. So it's not that I have confidence about the way the future's going, but you need to have this sort of underlying self-confidence that you have value, that you can help people, you're doing good work. Like that, there's a vibe there and people pick that up. If you don't have that, they pick that up too. So confidence is so important. Looking at what other people are doing and they're doing different stuff, it shatters that confidence and that's bad for business. And then two, here's the, one of the biggest problems. You see your competitor doing something and then now you go change what you're doing when you probably were fine doing what you're doing. A, just because your competitor's doing it doesn't mean it's working for them. Like, just because they had a Memorial Day sale doesn't mean it worked. Just because they're launching a membership doesn't mean anyone's joining. Just because they sent out really great looking emails doesn't mean that those were effective. Just because they're using pink for their buttons doesn't mean that that's the color you should be. Like, we don't know, just because we see them doing something, that it's working. That's the problem. You, none of us know what's working behind the scenes. So, don't assume what people are doing is working because what most people are doing is not working. It just isn't. And I know that because I coach business owners. I coach online business owners. Most of what you see is activity and nothing more. It's guesses. It's someone, some other influencer told them to do it. They're, they're watching people like me on YouTube and they're trying things. Now, hopefully the people they're paying attention to know what they're talking about. And I would like to think that I know what I'm talking about. But who knows why they're doing what they're doing? And then who knows if it's working for them? It might be, and I hope it is for their sake, whoever they are, but it may not. So don't copy something because you saw it because it may not be working. And then even if it's working for them and it, they're just printing money, it has no bearing on whether it's going to work for you. You're different. Your audience is different. Everything's different. So don't just copy what other people are doing and then apply it to your own stuff because it may not work. What I teach you here are principles that I want you to internalize, think through with your own audience and your own goals, and then try to apply some of those principles to see if they work. But we're, you know, you're, you're learning from me because I'm breaking it down for you. This isn't just you seeing what I'm doing. If you just look at what I'm doing and try to read between the lines and copy it, that's much harder than listening to me break it down and tell you what's happening behind the scenes so that you understand the inner workings of it. That's very different. That's you applying knowledge. But it's not knowledge when you just see somebody doing something, you copy it. So copying, just it could take you off on the wrong track. You could have a really good thing going, and then you could totally blow it up by just changing it because you saw Joe Schmo doing something that you thought was awesome. And it may not be awesome, or at least not awesome for you. I can't even tell you how many hours most of you are wasting. I can't even begin to comprehend how many hours you're wasting paying attention to what everyone else is doing in your space. Who cares? In fact, if you see them doing something, you should probably do the opposite. When people zig, you should probably zag. Like, 
if everyone's doing it and then you go do it, guess what? You're going to look like, sound like, be like everyone else. And then why is anyone going to pay attention to you? Why is anyone going to watch your videos or listen to your podcasts or read your emails when it's just the same as everybody else's? The goal isn't to find safety in doing what everyone else is doing, right? That's human nature. What's everyone else doing? How are they dressing? How are they doing their hair? What kind of car do they drive? What does their house look like? Like, I just want to be like everybody else. And we do that because we don't want to be noticed. We're afraid to be noticed because if you're noticed, there's that fear from elementary school or middle school that like you'll be embarrassed. So it's just easier to blend in. If I just blend in, I'll be safe. I think that's what's underneath all of this. If I, just, I want to blend in, I want to just look like everybody else. And my friend, that's the opposite of what you want to do. You want to stand out. You have to stand out. If you want your business to grow, stand out. That could be in what you wear. That could be in your personality. It could be in polarizing content. That could be in a very different looking website. It could be a very different business model, very different products, very different pricing. It, whatever it is, don't be like everybody else. You need to be noticed. You need to stand out. When people zig, like I said, you should zag. Not arbitrarily, but I want you to be you and I want you to be different. And the more you look at your competitors, the more you will become just like them. Don't do it. It doesn't put money in your pocket. And it, at worst, it probably is hampering your business. It's probably making you more and more vanilla, blending in, nobody's gonna care. Listen, those are five things. If you were to clean up your email game, outsource, stop responding, and batch your email, if you were to like ignore social media 99% of the time, if you were to outsource easily outsourceable repetitive tasks, if you were to stop tweaking your website and then stop paying attention to your competitors, you could easily get five to 10 hours a week back of your life. Imagine what you can do with an extra five to 10 hours a week. You could probably finish filming that course you need to film. You could probably write the sales page that you need to write. You could probably write some emails to promote to your list. You could probably come up with an awesome mini series to do on YouTube and film it. You could probably reach out to an awesome person to collaborate with and do some kind of partnership or affiliate deal with. You could probably sit in a quiet place and read a personal development or business book and work on yourself and get some good ideas of how you can grow your business. You could probably take a deep dive on your analytics and see where the leaky holes are in the boat and what's going well and what you want to double down on. Like win back five to 10 hours of your week by cutting out this, these time wasters, you'll, you'll crush. You'll crush. And dude, if you do none of that and you just get five to 10 hours of your life back and you sleep in an extra hour in the morning or you cut out an hour or two earlier each day or you have time to pick up your kids from school or now you have time to have dinner with your spouse or now you have time to go to the gym. These are amazing things, right? Like game over. That kind of stuff, that self-work, that family work, that like holistic approach to life makes you a better business owner in the long run as well because you're a healthier, happier, more relationally satisfied human being. Your time is so valuable. I don't want you to waste it on things that won't move your business forward. You may not believe me, but I'm here to help you. I'm literally in your corner. These are time wasters. Give them up either entirely or outsource the majority of it. You can do it. I want you to have time back so that you can have a healthier life and you can work on your business and grow your, your business to where it really needs to be. Do the things that really move the business forward, that really put money in your pocket. That's it. So your homework, if you're watching on YouTube, start with some accountability. Leave a comment below and let us know what's the number one time waster of those five that you need to deal with this week. You might be struggling with all five or two or three or four, but what's the number one, the one that you're like, oh my gosh, that's me. If you're watching on YouTube, leave a comment below and let us know which one of those time wasters it is so we can hold you accountable. And if you're just listening on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, I want you to identify it right now. Pause this and say, which of these five? Is it email? Is it social media? Is it repetitive tasks I could outsource? Is it tweaking my website or is it paying attention to my competitors? Which one of those five is your number one time suck, your number one time waster? Identify it first, and then I want you to do one, take one massive step of action, one step to make a change in that area. You don't have to do all the things, but identify what's the number one time waster of those five right now, and then this week, take one step of action towards eliminating 
that task so you have more time in your week? Just one step. What's the next step? Is it picking a time to batch your emails? Is it hiring a virtual assistant? Is, are you not even there? Is it just identifying the tasks that you do and seeing which ones you don't really need to be a part of? What's the next step? That's all I want you to do. And then if you're freeing up even just 30 minutes a day, which my friend is three hours a week, right? That's enough time to create a passive income business on the side. If you can just get 30 minutes a day of your life back by freeing up some of these time wasters, you could take my passive income workshop, which is free, apply the material 30 minutes a day and build your first thousand dollars a month or more of passive income. It's a free workshop, grahamcochran.com slash workshop. Watch it, apply it, change your life, scale your business while working less. That's what I'm all about. I hope that's what you're about as well. And I hope you've enjoyed this episode. It's been awesome hanging out with you. Hope you're doing amazingly, staying healthy and safe. And as always, I'll see you on another episode real soon.